Um, my name is Tracy Washington Inger. I work for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And what I'm going to be doing here for the next 15 minutes or so with you is helping to, um, to provide the resources and the tools that we have at the Environmental Protection Agency in our indoor air quality tools for schools program that will, we hope, help you sort of operationalize some of the myriad guidance that's coming out from various agencies and organizations like Claire's organization who has put out tremendous guidance to help schools reopen. What we'd like to do is to, to help you sort of organize some of that and operationalize it so that you can help your schools and school districts move into action to be best prepared for reopening. So um, from my experience, I, you know, I've been doing this for about 25 years um, with, the, uh, with the EPA, and before that I was a Peace Corps volunteer teaching in a school overseas, and so my entire career has pretty much been devoted to, uh, to education and to those educational spaces, and so like a lot of you, um, that has been, that, that's been my service place. Um, so also, like a lot of you, um, what I have come to recognize and understand about schools, while I dwell primarily in the physical environment space, what we have come to understand is that to create really truly healthy indoor environmental learning spaces, the spaces where students and staff are gonna be the healthiest and the most productive, we really have to be looking at this like a what we call this three-legged stool um, that recognizing that schools are so much more than just the place where you know students come to get an academic education where they learn is just as important and i know i'm preaching to the choir a little bit here and there are going to be some slides that i'm just going to touch on lightly but i wanted you to have them in your arsenal in your slide deck as you go into these conversations with across disciplines within your schools and your school districts in the, when it comes to addressing reopening, especially in response to COVID-19. So we always wanna be looking at this balance between student and staff performance, occupant health, and the physical environment and where those things intersect and where our actions are having cross-cutting impacts across all of these uh, across all of these areas because that's the only way that we're actually going to have healthy safe clean schools is if we're looking at all of these things together and we also know that our schools really have become well, we've talked about it, a, a real safety net for our communities. And so they're not just providing an uh, you know, uh, academic uh, achievement, but also you know, they are the front line of social issues in our country. So whenever, whenever we have a big social issue, our schools really kind of become that social crucible for how we're addressing those things, whether it's, you know, desegregation or immunization or, you know, food or, or nutrition services. Our schools are that place where that happens. So it's really critical that, we, that we're able to address um, the physical environment in concert with these other areas. So we know, as, as Claire said, we are, uh, we're kind of up against it. We didn't come into this um, pandemic in the, you know, in the strongest place physically for our schools. Yes, we are coming in with older facilities that were already in need of repair. People have been kicking the, you know, the maintenance can down the road in terms of, of deferred maintenance, and it is showing up in, uh, in the concerns that we now have, the considerations that we now have specific to the pandemic, but those issues were there even before this, and we know that. So how have we been, you know, how are we now in a position to deal with some of those things long term that are, cr that are critical right now? in terms of the physical environment. We also know, um, as Claire referenced as well, that there is just a growing body of evidence that connects the physical environment, what's happening with ventilation, with air supply, with, you know, with the presence of pollutants in, the, in, in our schools and the direct connection that it has on students' abilities to learn and on, on staff performance as well. So, you know, being aware that the bottom line mission of schools to deliver the best academic outcomes is intricately, you know, uh, connected to the building performance as well. 
and of course, occupant health. And we, you know, we've been through a lot of this, and so I'm not going to dwell here very long. But recognizing, and a lot of you are asking this question about, you know, um, we're some of the same symptoms that we're seeing for this particular. Uh, pandemic are also symptoms that we see for other kinds of of um, of, uh, of diseases and other kinds of, of health issues. So you know, kind of how do we distinguish? And there are resources out there to help distinguish. Um, we have a number of organizations, you know, the uh, the um, Allergy and Asthma Network and others who are putting out information to help in that distinction. But recognizing also that improving the indoor air quality across the board is going to have an impact on some of those other uh, on not just the the pandemic, but on existing current health challenges that we've been having all along. And, you know, I feel like I would also be remiss if I didn't kind of touch here on also the fact that we have you know, this tremendous frontline uh, group of individuals in our cleaning and maintenance uh, um, staffs who and in our teaching staffs as well, who are exposed people all, consistently throughout their careers to a number of these pollutants. I like to say, you know, even for while we look at the impact that it's having on our on our kids, especially because they are, you know, the the uh, the majority of of, of uh, occupants in a building are going to be students. But even the most challenged student is going to get out of that school in a handful of years, whereas people who are uh, working in those schools, especially custodial staff, can spend decades in that school facing these exposures. And so it is incumbent upon us to make sure that they are operating in the safest possible environment. And that is especially true now for our, especially our cleaning and maintenance staff as we start talking about the different ways that we're going to approach managing the spread of infectious disease within our buildings and making sure that we are also making, uh, protecting those who are most vulnerable and are, are also exposed the most. As, and, and often that is our, our cleaning and maintenance staff. So in order to, um, to help with a number of those things, uh, one of the things that our program is doing is putting out um, numerous um, technical assistance guidance pieces that are directing people towards those resources that can help you take the specific steps and make the right choices to take on the right actions. And so this is one of the ones that we put out initially when, uh, when schools were closing down to help direct people to where the, where the current guidance was and to help direct them to our resources as well. Um, and EPA on a larger scale, as you've heard too, um, it is where we are uh, continuing to update constantly the questions around coronavirus, not just for schools, but across a larger across a larger range as well. Um, it is where you will find the the list in for disinfectants to use against COVID nineteen. Oh my goodness, five minutes left, and our CDC um, and the and also the other guidance. And we and we will continue to be posting guidance there as that becomes available. And also, please look at our design for the environment section as well, because that's also where you will find um, uh, the um, disinfectants that are also, you know, safer for the environment as well to be using. Okay. So just, I'm going to be able to just touch on some of the resources that we have within our program. And again, our Tools for Schools kit is one of the ways that we are encouraging people to look at some of the, the broader guidance that we're receiving. And there is guidance right now um, like from Claire's organization. There's guidance from CDC, from ASHRAE, from Harvard, all of it very good guidance. And when it comes time to actually put it into place, I'm gonna call on you to use our indoor air quality tools for schools guidance because what you will find there are specific checklists, fact sheets, sample policies, comprehensive IQ management plans to help you, to help direct you on what it actually means to do the things that the guidance is calling upon you to do. So when you are tailoring a program that is specific to your school or your school district's needs, this is how you do it. This is how you make sure that everything that you need to, every box you need to check, you're checking because we created the boxes for you. 
Okay, so the kit helps tell you exactly what it is you need to be doing in the classroom, checking it, you know, for the vents. When you when you say, you know, do we do what do we know what kind of outdoor air we're getting? Do we know where it's coming from in the classroom with food service, with every area that you would have to go through, we have a checklist to help guide your staff through it. But additionally, I want you to, we also have a, a framework here that helps take all the different guidance that is out there and put it into an operational framework that allows you to, again, really sort of operationalize what it is you're hearing. And just very quickly, what, what, what I think one of the upsides of what we're seeing from the guidance is, A, that it has validated this framework because what we're seeing is consistencies in the larger areas of the guidance, the uh, various guidance that's coming out that you can align right here, right? And help you organize. So when we talk about organizing, we talk about something like, you know, build an effective team. What we know is that there, there is no way that you're going to be able to reopen and address these issues if you don't have a cross-disciplinary team together addressing this. So you take something as, as that is, um, an action that is meant to address social distancing, like moving folks out of, moving kids out of the cafeteria and moving them into their classrooms to eat. That involves numerous departments if you're going to be able to do it successfully. So you, you it's not just about food service, it's not just about social distancing. How now are you going to, how does that change the cleaning and maintenance policies and practices that have to happen in that classroom once you move food service into that classroom? You have to be talking across, across disciplines. When it comes to communication, changing the language and the understanding, creating that transparency for your plan, really critical. We have one school district in Utah who's talking to you who says he has uh, already started training his staff. And when you look down at ACT, that whole training, the, the training of staff coming up in every piece of guidance, every piece of guidance is talking about the training. He's connecting that training to the communication and uh, helping his occupants and his staff understand what cleaning means in their district when they say we are cleaning what that means when we say we are deep cleaning what that means the distinction between sanitation and disinfecting and when it's necessary so that they so that people understand when you see us cleaning a desk with soap and water and we're not necessarily putting down a disinfectant every single time it is because you know this the, this cleaning practice is going to achieve this and so that communication factor becomes really critical. So again, the key drivers just really help you organize all of the guidance that you're receiving and tailor it for your particular situation. The same with the technical solutions. You know, when we have uh, strategies and approaches, especially around um, the HVAC system and things like integrated pests uh, or uh, integrated energy management. So I'm going to end here just a second. I'm going to go really quickly and you will have all of these and then we can talk about it more in our in our panel. But again, what we're finding is that the the guidance around especially HVAC systems and ventilation, which is huge. And, especially, and you all know, if you've been following the news that who has is is changing its um, guidance around the, the description of this disease as, an, as airborne. So ventilation is really critical, but what we're seeing is it's falling into about six different categories, outdoor ventilation, filtration, relative humidity, toilet areas, UVC and air cleaners, and maintenance personnel and practices. So when you look at those buckets, you're gonna to want to be layering those buckets over the specific technical assistance guidance that we're providing so that you are going through the checklist looking for these things specifically. It all kind of works in concert. Okay. The same with integrated, uh, integrated energy management solutions. And please, 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 please talk to your energy managers to, in, in concert with your facility managers and, and, and your business managers to recognize there are going to be some differences. And if, you, if, you have been, if your school district has been focused on energy savings, you have to consciously shift that thinking a little bit to balance it out with the needs that you're going to have now for ventilation in those spaces. Okay. So again, cleaning and maintenance, really critical. Again, layering those key areas over 
over your practices for cleaning and maintenance. We have asked for preventive maintenance for a long time. We have uh, tools to help with the preventive maintenance and they go even deeper into the specifics of what you need. So when you talk about, when they talk about filters and changing filters, we have guidance there for, you know, for, to help you determine when and how often. Um, where, you know, we recommend, we recommended before MERV 8 filters. Right now they're saying MERV 12 to 13, but at least a MERV 8. Okay. But all of our resources are there. Please download the mobile app for our, for our uh, checklist to be able to use them in your schools. And we made them to be low cost, no cost um, interventions. And so every school district can can this over to your staff and have them use those checklists, right? We have a webinar series coming up at the end of the of this month, starting on uh, July 30th, and then the next three three months, uh, three weeks, we have a webinar series on reopening, the first one on ventilation, the next one on cleaning and maintenance, and the next one is on comprehensive indoor air quality. But you can access all of our previous webinars as well to help you prepare. Okay? There are all of our resources, and thank you. Thank you very much. And it's, it's really exciting to be here with you, and we're excited to hear your questions.